In this video, we will continue our discussion over carbohydrates. I want to bring your attention to this figure. Now, remember in the last video where I said, okay, well, sometimes you're going to have an alpha anomeric carbon or you're going to have a beta anomeric carbon. You, you're probably wondering, well, you know, how does that happen? You know, how does the change between the alpha and the beta occur? Is there a, a separate type of reaction that always gives us beta? or a separate reaction that always gives us alpha? Not necessarily. Uh, what happens here is that inside of a solution, so let's say that you're doing an experiment, right, in the lab and you have a solution filled with glucose molecules, right? In a solution, the glucose, the D glucose, is going to uh, cyclicize, right? It's gonna become a slick, uh, cyclic compound. And in the process of the aldose condensation, or the hemiacetal reaction, you have kind of like this open chain figure. So this is called an open chain. This is an open chain right here because it's a chain that is open. It's about to close on itself, but right now it's open. And whenever this oxygen is about to attack this carbonyl, it has the option of either creating a alpha, an alpha uh, glucose pyranose. Uh, so just for reference, uh, pyranose is just kind of like a closed sugar molecule. It's a closed glucose molecule, okay? That's what it means. So it has the option to either uh, create the alpha glucose molecule or the beta glucose molecule. So for a split second, it's kind of deciding what to do. And depending on what is needed, for instance, if you're an ant, then the glucose molecule is going to pick the beta conformation to make the exoskeleton. But if you're, you know, uh, a potato starch molecule, then you're going to pick the alpha uh, conformation. So depending on what cell type it is or what it needs to do, it will pick the different uh, conformations accordingly. Okay. So this process of either picking between alpha or beta is called the mute, uh, the muto rotation. So this is kind of like mutating, right? So mu for mutation or for transformation. And then rotation is just, you know, the different conformations that you can do. So this process is called muta rotation. Okay, so that is muta rotation. And essentially it's just picking, okay, well, do I need to be an alpha or do I need to be a beta carbon, All right? That's all it's choosing in this intermediate step. Okay, so this is step one right here. This is kind of like the intermediate step. So step two. And this is going to be uh, the final step, right? So this is going to be step three. And it could pick either or, right? Now, because the sugars can actually become, you know, ketones and aldehydes, right? Uh, for instance, the ketone form, right? So the keto, the sorry, the ketone form for the glucose molecule is very similar to the ketone form for the uh, aldehyde glucose molecule. Uh, they're very similar, okay? And because of, the, of their similarity, they can actually do the same types of reactions. So the reaction for an aldehyde is going to be the same reaction for a ketone. But why is that important? Well, I should say that monosaccharides are very, very oxidative, okay? So if you oxidate a monosaccharide, you will get some energy out of the monosaccharide, okay? So that's what your body does. So let's say you're running a marathon. Your body is performing an oxidative reaction to those monosaccharides to produce glucose molecules. And those glucose molecules are going to provide energy for your body, okay? So whenever a sugar in general can be oxidized, we call that a reducing sugar. Right? And we call it a reducing sugar because we have oil rig, right? So let's say um, that the sugar can be oxidized, right? So oxidation means that it is the loss of electrons, or you can think of it as the loss of hydrogens. Or if you want to be more complicated, you can say that it is the gain of oxygens. Right, because literally oxidation means the gain of oxygens. And we call whatever is oxidating. We call that the reducing agents, okay? And so whenever we say, oh, the sugar can be oxidized, we call that sugar a reducing sugar, okay? And 
you should know that the aldehydes, specifically aldoses, can be oxidized easily, right? So this sugar right here, this D-glucose sugar, can be oxidized really, really easily. If it were a ketone, well, the ketone would have to do isomerization. Let's just say it's a um, conversion to aldehyde, right? So the ketone, yeah, it can be oxidized, but it has to go through a little additional step to become an aldehyde, and then that aldehyde will go through the oxidative process and be converted into energy, okay? And we can say that all sugars, so all sugars, uh, well, uh, specifically the ones that can be oxidized, so that uh, can be oxidized, have a free aldehyde group. Have a free aldehyde group. Like this one right here, okay? So it's not too much to understand you just have to know that um, the sugars that can be oxidized are, you know, they're going to have the aldehyde groups. And sugars that have a ketone group are going to convert to the aldehyde. And then that aldehyde will be, uh, you know, broken down into energy. It will be oxidized. Therefore, we can say that all monosaccharides are reducing sugars. What does that mean? That means that all monosaccharides have the ability to you know have an aldehyde group so if a monosaccharide has an aldehyde group you can do it quickly if a monosaccharide has a ketone group you have to do a little bit more steps to become the aldehyde um, the key point is that the aldehyde is the easiest uh, ox oxidative uh, compound or i guess functional group of the sugar in order for the sugar molecule or the carbohydrate to be oxidized, it has to have a reducing end, okay? We, you might see that as a called uh, reducing head, but really it's a reducing uh, anomeric carbon. So what does that mean? It means that this carbon has, you know, an oxygen that has a hydrogen. Well, that's a lot of words, but what it really means is that the carbon just has the ability to be reduced. What does that mean again? It means that this hydrogen can pop off, right? And that is going to be reducible. Therefore, this carbon right here and this carbon right here are anomeric and reducible, okay? So what do we get when, when we uh, reduce this anomeric carbon? Well, if we were to reduce this oxygen right here, well, this hydrogen would come off and this hydrogen would also come off, right? And what we're left with is this guy. So we have oxygen with whatever is attached there. We have a carbon. We also have some other stuff, carbons. We're not really focused on it. And then we have this oxygen, which has what? Let's see, two, four, six, eight. So we have two, four, let's see. Uh, two, four, mm -hmm, six, eight. So there were two lone pairs, uh, before the reducing, and now there's going to be a full octet, okay? And also this hydrogen popped off, so it looks weird, but we can do this, right? And that's perfectly valid. If you didn't know that this has too much, uh, too many electrons, right? So, of course, you don't want to make that mistake, so we're going to erase this, right? Now the two hydrogens that left, they're usually picked up by a different molecule, right? That's going to do some reactions by itself, but we can actually figure out in a reactions test if there are some reducing sugars. So let's say you have a compound that you don't know what is, this, you know, you don't know what is inside that compound. Well, you can do a Tollens test, right? So do you remember what a Tollens test was? Well, essentially a Tollens test was that you were going to use silver uh, ammonium, right? And you're going to put some aldehydes on it. And if aldehydes were detected, it would convert the aldehydes, it would reduce them or oxidate them, right? Uh, excuse me, it would actually oxidate them. So um, it would create a carbo carboxylic acid, I guess. And it would create kind of like this mirror image 
on the test tube. So you would look into the, the test tube and you would see your reflection and it was silver and it was really beautiful and amazing. And so you can do the same thing for this right here. So if we put silver uh, ammonium is going to oxidate or you know take away this hydrogen and create a ketone, right? So here this was oxidized and we call this end right here the reducing agent. Okay, or the, it's, it's going to get um, reduced. Okay, so whenever it is reduced, we know that it was a singular glucose molecule and that can be used as pure energy. Okay, so to summarize, aldehydes and carbohydrates can be easily oxidized into energy, right? Ketones can be also oxidized, however, they have to be oxidized to aldehydes, and then those aldehydes have to be oxidized, right? And whenever we want to oxidize something, we have to make sure that we have a reducible end, okay? So it's an anomeric carbon that can give up a hydrogen or two hydrogens and create energy, right? I want to briefly touch upon esters, right? So the way you form esters is that you're going to add an acid to an alcohol, right? So whenever you add an acid to an alcohol, you're going to get an ester. And notice that we have a phosphate group attaching itself to this carbon. Now, what was the original carbon? Remember that we always have some chunk, right? And this chunk has CH2, and then it's going to have an alcohol on it, right? And so what happened here is that phosphate bound itself to this alcohol and created an ester. Why is that important? Why should I care? Well, whenever you enjoy a banana split sundae, you're eating glucose, right? You're, you're having some simple sugars and it tastes great. Um, but if you didn't have this phosphate, this phosphate group attaching itself to the glucose molecule, well, you know, you're not going to get any energy. You're not going to feel. Uh, you're not going to feel the sugar rush. You're not going to have a sugar crash. You're not going to regret your life's decisions leading up to that Sunday because your body didn't process the glucose. How does this allow us to process glucose? Remember when I said that your cells. Let's call this box a cell. Your cells need glucose, right? And so glucose G is going to go in here, into the cell and hang out. Now, without phosphorylation, the glucose is just going to go out the cell and not interact for a long time. However, inside the cell, we have ATP, right? And then ATP is going to react with the glucose, and it's going to give up its phosphate group, okay? So ATP loses one of its phosphates and now only has two phosphates. So it generates ADP, which is diphosphate, not triphosphate, right? And we still have glucose, okay? But we're just gonna say that this glucose has a phosphate group on it, and it also has ADP, okay? So let's write that, ADP, right there, okay? Now, this is important because the phosphate group is going to interact with the glucose and stop the glucose from entering or uh, from exiting the cell and now that the glucose is stuck inside the cell it can be processed via uh, metabolic pathways to release the energy needed to do um, you know reactions okay so without this cute little uh, phosphate bind binding itself to the glucose molecule you wouldn't have the energy to blink or read or write you would always have a constant headache you know and um, in order to do this you need an enzyme and these classes of enzymes are going to be called kinases. Okay, so what are kinases? So kine, that stands for kinetics, right? So that's kinetic. And aces just means enzyme. And so literally it means moving enzyme. Why? Well, without this enzyme, you wouldn't have this reaction moving into completion, right? So you need an enzyme to kind of facilitate this transfer of a uh, phosphate group to the glucose molecule. And that specific uh, enzyme is called hexokinase. And we'll learn about that in glycolysis.
So hexokinase, you know, he um, essentially goes to the glucose molecule, gets an ATP, breaks off a phosphate group and attaches it to the glucose molecule. And now the glucose molecule can't get outside of the cell and it is processed by the body to do uh, energy production, okay? So this one right here is called ester, esterification. So this is esterification. So there you go. And esterification is, you know, arguably one of the most um, beneficial processes that our body does. Okay, without esterification, we wouldn't have energy. That's why it's so important to know and to, you know, keep in your head going into the exam. So the most beneficial esterification that we have is phosphorylation of the glucose molecule. Okay. Now we're going to discuss disaccharides. So disaccharides are more uh, interesting, I, I would say, right? So we have disaccharides. And these are pretty, pretty cool, right? So what is a disaccharide? Essentially, it is a monosaccharide that is bonded to another monosaccharide via a glycosidic bond. Okay, and to do this glycosidic bond, you need one anomeric carbon combined with a random uh, alcohol, right? So, uh, for this example, you know, we attacked this alcohol, but there's nothing that says we can't attack this one, right? Or even this one, it doesn't matter. We can even have uh, gotten this guy, right? So, it really just depends on the anomeric carbon and you know some random alcohol. Usually you don't see too many reactions with that, okay? So when this happens, you are going to kind of shoot off a water molecule, right? So look at what happens here. At first, we have an alcohol and then we have a hydrogen, right? But then when we do the reaction, we're just going to have a glycosidic bond. So this is a glycosidic bond. So the OH plus the H gives you the water. So we can say that overall disaccharides and polysaccharides, well, they're formed via a dehydration reaction. Okay, so this is a dehydration reaction. Dehydration reaction. Okay. Now, how do we name this? Hmm. Well, it seems that the way you name this is that you read it from left to right, right? So if this alcohol were on the top, this would be a beta carbon or a beta glucose, right? And so you would have beta in the name. But since this is an alpha, al uh, alpha alcohol or alpha anomeric carbon, you're going to have an alpha in the name. And now I'm going to share with you the format for naming disaccharides. And it is as follows. It is the first sugar name. So the first sugar name dash, and then we're going to have either an alpha or beta. You know, this depends on whether this is alpha or this is beta. In this example, it is alpha, right? And then we're going to have the what we're going to have the second carbon name right or excuse me the first carbon number so we have uh, first carbon number okay and then uh, that is going to be pointing towards the second carbon number okay and then we're going to have the second sugar name And so this looks like a lot, but it's not. It's really simple. Okay, so what is the first sugar name? Without looking at anything else, we can tell that this is going to be a glucose molecule, okay? So that is a glucose molecule. And if you were kind of you know, keen on what I said about monosaccharides, you would know that for the most part, monosaccharides tend to be D-orientated, so they're right-handed. And uh, if you want to be more specific, you can say, oh, this is D-glucose. But if you just put glucose, it's going to be assumed that it's in the D-conformation, okay? So 
we can put that this is going to be, um, let's just be more specific, say D-glucose, okay, D-glucose dash, and this is going to be alpha, okay, alpha, now the first carbon number. What carbon number is this? Typically the anomeric carbon is the first carbon, so we're going to say 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now we do the same thing for this guy, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, and 6 right there. So it is the first carbon number, right? So it's the first carbon number. So we can put C1, or we could just put 1, right? And then we're going to put an arrow pointing towards the second carbon number, which is what? 4. So what I said was the first carbon number on the glucose is going to be 1. Okay. And if we look on the other molecule that is going to be attached to the first molecule, we see that this alcohol is attached to the fourth carbon. So we put four okay, right there. And then we can say the second sugar name. So this is going to be uh, D-glucose. Okay. So n uh, the beta does not count. You don't have to put, oh, beta D-glucose. You could just put D-glucose. Uh, D glucose. So that's how you name it. Again, it is the first sugar name. Is it alpha or is it beta? Oh, it was alpha. Okay. So now we put that the alpha carbon or the alpha confirmation was on the first carbon. And that first carbon is going to make a bond with the fourth carbon on the other molecule. And that other molecule, that other sugar is called a D glucose. So that's all there is, right? So disaccharides are more interesting than monosaccharides because there's a lot of variations, okay? So this right here is called maltose, but if you were to do a beta uh, glycosidic bond, it would be a different sugar, and that sugar would have different properties. It might taste different. It might have different uh, structural properties or chemical properties. And depending on what you do, you're going to have a bunch of sugar types. Right? So disaccharides have more uh, variation in their structures. But you also have to be careful whenever you're doing disaccharides because you cannot mutarotate anymore. Right? So disaccharides can't mutarotate, uh, cannot mutarotate. Let's say that glucose is having an identity crisis. We all have identity crisis. You know? It's not. It's nothing special, but this glucose molecule is saying, "Well, right now I'm alpha, but I really need to be beta." So what I can do is I can break this bond, and I can convert myself back to the aldehyde, and then I'm I'm going to do the reaction again, and become a beta. So what I'm saying is that monosaccharides have the ability to kind of go between a closed uh, molecule and an open molecule, right? And it can choose if it wants to be uh, alpha or beta. So again, that is muta rotation. However, when you are a disaccharide, you are you know forming a bond, and you can't just break the bond and then go back to this conformation right here, and then you know go back to an aldehyde. No, you can't do that because look what happened, right? Look what happened. You lost a water. You lost two hydrogens. You just can't go back to your original starting point. And assume that you're going to have the hydrogens back. It's not how it works, right? It that is a you know, that's a complete reaction. You can't just go back to the starting point. And so what I'm trying to say is, disaccharides cannot mutarotate. They cannot say, oh well, I was alpha. I don't want to be uh, maltose. I want to be something else. You can't do that. Right? So just remember. And just a fun fact, if you were to change this, if it were to muta rotate into the beta conformation and it were to do a glycosidic bond with this other molecule, right, then what you would have is something pretty cool. You would have a base, right, or a cellul... well, you would have cellulose, right, so that's, that's the sugar that you would have. And cellulose, of course, is the major component in cell walls and uh, tree bark and whatnot, so you would not be able to digest that, right, but that is a sugar. And that is a different variation. We didn't change anything else 
other than the uh, conformation of the alpha to the beta, right? And remember when I said that if you have a beta bond, you can't digest it because your enzymes do not process an enzyme, or excuse me, your body does not uh, produce an enzyme that can process the beta glycosidic bonds, right? So if this sugar, you know, that can be found in your cereal has its alpha glycosidic bond removed and replaced with a beta glycosidic bond, you would be chewing on tree bark or, you know, a very firm uh, substance and that's not good. So again, it's those little changes in sugars that have different physical property changes and it's really amazing. Now I want to talk to you about chitin, right? So chitin is the hard material that makes up the exoskeletons of insects and crustaceans and some cell walls of some fungi, right? So some funguses have um, chitin as the cell wall component. And essentially what chitin is, is a beta glycosidic bond, right? So this is a beta glycosidic bond. Um, let's just call that glycobond, right? And it looks very similar to, you know, maltose, and it looks very similar to cellulose. But what's the difference? Well, maltose is an alpha glycosidic bond, let's get that straight. And cellulose, well, it's the same thing, except it doesn't have this weird group. What is this weird group? Well, this weird group is called the N-acetyl, acetoglucose amine. Okay, so that's what it's called. And this is AC right there. All right, so what is this N-acetoglucosamine gonna do? Well, what it does is that it allows the chain, or I guess the disaccharide, to perform more hydrogen bonding with each other. Okay, so instead of writing this structure out, I'm just gonna write chitin, right? I'm gonna write chitin right here. So we have uh, chitin. And it's going to be glycosidically bond to this uh, carbon right here. And we have uh, hydrogen, right? So now what's gonna happen is that you have these chitin uh, sugars kind of inside the body. And what's gonna what they're gonna do is that they're going to bond hydrogen bond to each other. And these hydrogen bonds keep going and going and going and going because there's a lot of molecules that, you know, are chitinous, right? So because of these increased um, hydrogen bondings, the overall structure is going to be really, really strong, right? And so that's why it is an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton or the strength of the exoskeleton is increased by the hydrogen bonding. So the N-acetoglucose amine increases hydrogen bonding, okay? So this actually increases increases hydrogen bonding amongst uh, chitin sugars, okay? Amongst uh, chitin sugars. And so literally whenever you see an ant or a crab, they're made of sugar. You can't eat that sugar. I mean, whenever you're eating crabs, you're, you're not eating the shell, right? And that would be bad for your digestive system. And so that is essentially um, why their, their outer membrane is so firm and rigid. It is because of these increased uh, H bondings between the N-acetoglucosamine. Um, and some people might say that uh, chitin is a derivative of cellulose. And really it is, because you could just get a cellulose uh, molecule, uh, take off the alcohol on the adjacent carbon, and just put an, um, an N-acetyl glucosamine. And so you can say that chitin is a derivative, meaning you know you can create it. So derivative of cellulose. Okay. So these are pretty important. So on the exam, or for typical biochemistry classes, you're asked a lot of information between cellulose, chitin, and just normal glucose, right? So chitin and cellulose, those are beta glycosidic bondage, and you don't eat those, right? And then the chitin can be created from cellulose. All you have to do is just add an N-acetoglucosamine to the adjacent carbon, uh, because initially this was an alcohol, 
they took it out and they put the N-acetylglucosamine. And that increases hydrogen bonding, which creates the rough and firm um, exoskeleton. We would now be talking about everyone's favorite sugar, lactose. Okay, So lactose is just a creation between a galactose monosaccharide uh, that is beta-glycosidically bonded to a glucose monosaccharide. Okay, so it's galactose plus glucose, right? And you're probably saying, well, it's a beta bond, right? So we can't process it. Well, a lot of us can, okay? There are some people who were cursed when they were born and they don't have the enzyme that can break down the beta-glycosidic bond, okay? So the exception to humans not being able to digest beta-glycosidic sugars is lactose, okay? Because humans, for the most part, uh, create an enzyme called lactase, okay? So lactase, lactase uh, breaks down, breaks down uh, this bond, okay? So it breaks down this bond right here, and we can enjoy sugars uh, from ice cream, hamburgers, Pop-Tarts, if they have milk in them, I guess. Uh, we can enjoy a lot of things. But some people are not as lucky, and they don't have that enzyme, okay? And so now you have uh, this multi-trillion dollar industry in America that creates milk without lactose. So you have uh, you know, lactose-free milk. You have lactose-free ice cream, etc. Because some people, again, don't have the ability to produce the enzymes that are naturally occurring in our stomachs called lactase, right? So uh, typically, biochemistry classes like to test on this. They're saying, you know, what enzyme breaks down the um, lactose beta-glycosidic bond? You're going to say lactase, right? And so the absence of that enzyme creates lactose intolerance. Right, and uh, essentially, when you're lactose intolerant, you don't have the uh, ability to break this down. So this molecule just sits in your stomach, and it sits there, and it waits, and it's being digested. But whenever it gets digested, it produces a lot of gas, and that gas causes discomfort, it causes uh, stomach pains, and it's not a good time. Okay, so that's why this is kind of like very important for us to have lactase. Right, so uh, that's it for lactose. And if you're interested in knowing the specific enzyme that companies exploit to break down this bond, it's called the um, it's called the beta uh, galacto galactosidase. Ugh. Galact from uh, this comes from the galactose. So we have galactosidase. Okay. So that is the enzyme that breaks down this bond. Um, so we put enzyme that breaks down bond and that used that they're used in uh you know industrial purposes so even if you remember this you're gonna remember okay well i know that lactose uh uses this bond so that therefore lactose is made from a, a galactose molecule right and usually we're working with glucose so galactose plus glu glucose is equal to lactose oh some people can't digest lactose therefore it should be a beta glycosidic bond Right. So it's not too difficult to uh, kind of memorize the structures that I'm showing you. Don't memorize the shape, just memorize the components. Sucrose is a bit weird. It's weird because it is a combination of 50% glucose and 50% fructose. But what makes it weird is that both the anomeric carbons are involved in the glycosidic bonds. What? Right? Like, normally it's just one anomeric carbon combined with an alcohol, but in sucrose, it is the anomeric carbon of one molecule that is glycosidically bonded to the other anomeric carbon. Hmm. Okay. Over here, oh, well, first of all, I want to kind of step back a little bit. Remember that fructose? is a, well, it's a sugar created from a ketose, right? And so this sugar is going to have something like, a, it's gonna have a weird shape. How can I say? Essentially, it's like this. We have a R group, we have the, oh, the oxygen. Uh, this one has the anomeric carbon, right? Has the carbon. 
and then it's going to have an R group. And on this carbon, you can have the CH2, OH, and also the alcohol, right? And of course, depending on the type of sugar, the alcohol could be on the bottom, or the, CO, the CH2, OH can be on the top. It depends. This right here, the beta, so this is a beta confirmation. Anyways, that is specifically for sugars that are created from a ketone. Fructose is one of the sugars that were created from a uh, ketone. So therefore, it has this extra group right here, right? So that's all you need to know about that. Anyways, like I was saying, the first mole, well, this carbon right here is anomeric. And so it is actually the second carbon that is going to be bound to the first carbon right here. And the way you name this is very similar to the way you name normal sugars. You name it from left to right. So this was alpha because this alcohol was at the bottom. So this is going to be alpha. And this right here was, well, hmm. At this point right here, this is actually on the top. So the sugar is at the bottom, or excuse me, the alcohol is at the bottom. Hmm. It's weird. Anyways. So you just name it the same way you would name uh, normal sugars. And here's a better representation of it. Yeah, that's a weird photo. Hmm. I guess you should ignore this right here because this is not correct. I don't know why the textbook put that there. Anyways, so yeah, it's, you can clearly see that this is a beta confirmation and this is an alpha confirmation. Therefore, you should put alpha, beta, the first carbon is bound to the second carbon, and then that is a glycosidic linkage. So this is uh, sucrose. Okay, so uh, it's a very common sugar, and in your notes you should say, well, sucrose needs to have a separate designation, right? So you need to name it accordingly. It focuses on both the anomeric carbons, the anomeric carbon for the glucose molecule and the anomeric carbon for the fructose molecule. Okay, so it is a direct linkage, right? And sucrose is the only sugar that does not have a reducing end. So this has no reducing ends. Okay, so can we form chains that um, of sucrose? Can you literally say, oh, you know, this chain has 5,000 sucroses? No, a sucrose molecule is just a disaccharide. It would always be a disaccharide. So it's very simple, it breaks down, it it's pretty um, sweet, right? So uh, factories and companies actually exploit sucrose. They create products that have sucrose in them because it's sweeter. Um, it doesn't have, you know, a lot of energy needed to break down this bond, right? Because after all, it is an alpha bond. So yeah. Uh, now I want to talk about high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup as well. So corn syrup is just made of glucose. High fructose corn syrup is just fructose, pure fructose, combined with corn syrup. So again, that is pure fructose combined with pure glucose. They're not going to react. They're not going to make disaccharide bonds, right? No. Instead, whenever you eat high fructose corn syrup in a cookie or uh, in a drink or something, your body immediately absorbs those glucoses and immediately absorbs those fructoses. And fructose, again, is one of the sweetest sugars in the universe. So when your body gets all that energy at once, it goes crazy. It has like a lot of reactions going on. You know, you feel great, but it's not good for you because that's not natural, right? Nowhere in, the, in, in nature is pure fructose just wandering around. That's not possible. And so that's why a lot of people warn you to kind of stay away from high fructose corn syrup. It is kind of like a bastardization of fructose and um, glucose, okay? So too pure, too much energy, and a little bit of time, that's bad, right? We will now be talking about polysaccharides. So poly, polysaccharides. So essentially, it's just a bunch of monosaccharides linked together in a long chain, right? And polysaccharides are commonly used for structure and what? And for storage, okay? So these are uh, used for storage and structure. Okay, 
So a good example of storage would have to be starch. Okay, so uh, in corn or in different plants, there is kind of like a white powdery residue. Uh, essentially, when whenever you dry corn, you're gonna get this white powdery substance that is starch. And what makes up starch uh, is amylose. Okay, so amylose is a lot of these uh, sugar molecules bound together. Okay, so notice there you're going to have these uh, kind of like weird structures together. But the disaccharide of the amylose would have to be the maltose. So this is maltose. And you should know that the amylose has a reducing end and a non-reducing end, okay? So what does that mean? Over here, you're gonna find the reducing end. That means that, well, let's just put, mm, Let's put another glucose molecule over here. So we're gonna have glucose, and essentially a reducing end, you have the ability to form another glycosidic bond, right? But on the non-reducing end, you're not gonna form any bonds. Yes, you do have an anomeric carbon, oh, excuse me, you do have a carbon that can give up an alcohol, but you're not gonna do it. So essentially, it looks like this. Amylose has a starting glucose, and it's, be, it's gonna be bound to another glucose, and another glucose. Together, this makes uh, maltose. Okay, and then another glucose, and so on and so forth. Right. So this one right here is going to have a reducing end because it has to bound. It has to be able to bind to another glucose to continue the chain, and this one is going to have a non-reducing end. And that's just kind of like the first molecule that was placed there, right? And so now you have this really cool uh, structure that we've created. And in nature, amylose is used for structure and some support, a little bit of support, but mainly structure. And amylose can actually be wound very tightly in a coil. And I have a really cute picture that I'm gonna show you guys in a second. But before I do that, since uh, amylose is a major uh, tested polysaccharide, I, I should tell you that amylose, amylose is created via uh, alpha one through four uh, glycosidic bond. Okay, so that's all there is, and this kind of depends on the D glucose. So before we move on, just know that amylose is created by a long string a long string, excuse me, of D-glucose molecules. Whenever you cut the amylose and you get two of these D-glucose molecules combined, you know, whatever here is uh, in the parentheses, that is called a maltose. So maltose is just glucose plus glucose and they're alpha, alphaly bonded, right? And the amylose is used for structure. It's a major component in starch and it has a reducing end and a non-reducing end. And it can also be uh, formed into a helical shape. It can be coiled. So here we have our molecules, right? So this is kind of like the uh, cyclical conformation that we can have. These hexagons represent glucose. Okay, so this is uh, glucose. And this right here is the non-reducing end. And this right here is the reducing end. Because you can put another glucose molecule and then you can continue the cycle. It's important for you to know that per turn, this is gonna have six, uh, six glucose molecules. So six glucose molecules, glucoses per turn. And this is actually a left-handed structure. So this is a left-handed uh, structure. So it actually kind of, if you were to imagine uh, yourself closing a water bottle, your thumb would be kind of going in the same direction as the amylose molecule or amylose chain. And here we have a nice, cute little uh, 3D photo of this, right? So you can see that this is the um, excuse me the glucose. 
This is the glycosidic bond, which is alpha. And it's just overall a very nice picture. So there you go. Well, because amylose is really long, it's not that rigid, right? So for instance, if you were to build uh, a little tower made from popsicle sticks, yes, it would be a large tower, but if you touch it, it would topple, it would fall over. And so we need something that will offer support to the, uh, to the amylose. And so that's where amylopectin uh, comes in. So this is amylopectin. And you can kind of consi consider it as super glue, right? So you're still going to be working with like a glucose thingy, right? But instead, um, you're going to kind of bind itself to the amylose. Well, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that over here we have the amylose molecule. So we have amylose. And, you know, it's spiraling, and that's cool. But it's not that rigid. And so we're going to introduce another uh, molecule, okay? And that molecule is going to kind of bind itself between the alpha 1 and 6, right? So the atomeric carbon is going to bind itself to the main amylose chain, right? So we can say that amylose uh, uses, or excuse me, amylopectin uses amylose as a backbone, right? So it uses amylose as a backbone, and that offers support. So now you have uh, kind of like this other chain of molecules connected via the 1-6 uh, glycosidic bond, and that offers support. That offers uh, strength to the overall molecule. And we can take it one step further. On the amylopectin, it can combine with another amylopectin. Isn't that kind of weird? So above this amylopectin, you're going to have another one, and that is going to attach itself to this uh, to this structure right here, OK? So essentially, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have amylopectin, and it's going to go up to another amylopectin, and it's going to take away this oxygen or this alcohol and connect itself. And so amylopectin to amylopectin is a one to six, uh, you know, glucose bonding or a glycosidic bonding. So we could say amylopectin, so we have amylopectin connects to amylopectin via uh, kind of like an alpha one two six um, bond right here, and that's all there is. Okay, that's all there is. And then amylopectin is going to connect to the main chain, to the main amylose chain via the one six glycosidic bond. So it's the same thing, right? And I have another picture that kind of shows this point in better detail. So here we have kind of like the, uh, the amylose, right? So this whole chain is amylose. And that is shown in this picture as something that is what? Something that is green, right? So these green little molecules are amylose molecules. And you can see that they're going in a left-handed spiral. But attached to these amylose chains, we have the amylopectin, which acts as support. And these amylose pectins are going to be connected to other amylose pectins. Okay, so this right here is a one uh, to six glycosidic bond, and these right here are actually one to four. Uh, both of them are alpha. Okay, so this is a alpha uh, one to four glycosidic bond. Okay, so you should know that these little yellow things right here are called non-reducing ends. So they don't connect to anything, right? And we can say that amylopectin has one non-reducing end, or excuse me, has it has one reducing end. I'm sorry. Uh, so amylopectin has one reducing end, and many non-reducing ends.
Okay, so it's a very nice picture and I would copy that down or at least take a picture of that uh, because it's very important, right? So again, uh, amylose is this green little chain, goes in a left-handed turn, about six glucoses per turn, and it's being supported by the amylopectin, and the amylopectin connects to the amylose chain via the one, sorry, via the alpha one to six glycosidic bond, and the amylopectin only has um, one reducing end and a lot of non-reducing ends. Now, whenever we eat starchy foods, for instance, uh, biscuits, we need an enzyme that can break down the amylose. And that enzyme is commonly found in saliva. So we can say that saliva, so saliva breaks down amylose. Specifically via amylase. And what happens there is that the amylose bond, or excuse me, the amylose molecule breaks and it gives a disaccharide. This disaccharide, of course, is called the maltose. And now another enzyme in your stomach, or specifically in your intestines, actually breaks down the, malte, uh, the maltose. So intestines equals enzyme. And specifically that is maltase. So now whenever the maltose uh, is in your intestines, the intestines secretes an enzyme called maltase, and the maltase breaks down the alpha glycosidic bond the 1,4-alpha-glycosidic bond, and yields two glucose molecules, okay? So now you have energy. And that's why, uh, you know, biscuits are a really good source of, of energy because biscuits have a lot of amylose in them. And then amylose gives a lot of maltose, and maltose gives about two glucose uh, molecules per uh, maltose sugar. So, yeah, I mean, it's very efficient. And now you know about amylose and amylopectin. Oh, and whenever it does break down, whenever the enzyme breaks down uh, the bonds, it goes through a hydrolysis reaction. So this is a hydrolysis reaction. We will now be talking about the animal polysaccharide storage uh, unit. Okay, so you remember in uh, the last slide we were talking about amylose and amylopectin? Well, amylose is the storage unit for you know sugars, but in plants, okay? So you get that in potatoes, corn, etc. Whenever you go to animals, like let's say a chihuahua, it will have glycogen. And so glycogen is just a polysaccharide, multiple sugars, which is what I'm trying to say, of glucose. Okay, so glycogen, glycogen is a polysaccharide of glucose. So poly polysac of glucose. And so it's really your body's way of storing a lot of glucose in a little pellet. This is what you're seeing right here. So um, this is what we're seeing. Uh, this is a shot in the liver. Okay, so you're going to see a lot of the glycogen in the body found in the liver, right? And usually glycogen is uh, typically in the form of a pellet or a granule. So um, think of sugar crystals, right? The way it looks is like little crystals, little pellets. That's the same way that glycogen looks like inside the liver, right? Now, you're not going to see like actual pellets. They're just really microscopic, okay? So that's what it looks like. And we actually uh, use glycogen to, well, we use it for energy. So, for example, whenever you're exercising, your body is using up ATP, right? And it needs a easily accessible source of sugar. And so it goes to the glycogen and it says, okay, glycogen, I need you to break me off a piece of glucose so I can use that glucose to generate ATP so I can work out. And glycogen says, all right, and it does some reactions and it releases glucose. And so we use glycogen to fuel our body uh, to produce ATP. So we could say glycogen, glycogen uh, gives uh, glucose for ATP in metabolic pathways, in metabolic pathways. Oop, 
So uh, for instance, in glycolysis, you're gonna have the need for a lot of glucose. Where do you get that glucose? Well, for the most part, you get it from the glycol, uh, excuse me, from the glycogen. So yeah, it's kind of like a little bank. Uh, you can think of this as a glu um, glucose bank. Glucose bank. Okay, so there we go. Uh, now, I, I want to go back to the liver. Now, the liver is pretty important for glycogen, okay? Uh, it's a major player in facilitating and maintaining the uh, glucose levels in the blood. So that's why the, the liver is the main organ that has the most amount of glycogen. Because if the liver did not have those uh, glycogen banks, as I like to call them, then your blood sugar would be all over the place, or it wouldn't be existing. Right? And you know, uh, if you don't have proper blood sugar levels, it could be lethal. Okay, so the liver, liver, has the most, has the most glycogen, and the liver actually regulates blood, uh, blood glucose levels. So it regulates uh, blood glucose, or you could say blood sugar. And so when people say, okay, well, I can go with you to the party, but I have to have, you know, some food with me because if I don't eat, my blood sugar is going to go low and that's not good for me. Well, what they're saying is, in the scientific sense, they're saying my glycogen levels deplete. They run out really, really quickly because of some sort of uh, disorder that I have, right? Some sort of medical history. And without the glycogen in my liver, I can pass out and that could be pretty lethal for me. And to further to further uh, show that point, here is a liver cell, okay? And this is fed. So we gave our friend Gizmo uh, a donut. And about 24 hours later of not eating, uh, this is the same liver cell without any food. So this is uh, starved, okay? So notice that there is a lot of uh, whiteness over here. So there isn't a lot of dark area, and that dark area is actually the glycogen. So we can say that glycogen is also a short-term, short, excuse me, short-term uh, glucose storage, okay? So glycogen, glycogen is a short-term glucose storage. And I'll just call that glue, glue uh, storage. How important is glycogen? Well, glycogen takes up about 10% of the liver's mass. So if you were to take a liver, uh, you know, a chunk of liver, one gram, or excuse me, uh, 100 grams of that liver, about 10 grams of that sample would be of pure glycogen. So that is a large percentage of glycogen in the liver. If you were to deplete the entire supply of glycogen, your liver would be 10% smaller, right? You would only have 90% of the mass left. So glycogen is a major component of liver. So we can say that glycogen, uh, glycogen equals 10% of liver. And overall, in your body, uh, your well, essentially, glycogen takes up one percent of your overall um, uh, muscle mass. Okay, so if you have a hundred pounds of muscle, then one pound of that sample is going to be a pure glycogen. We can say that glycogen equals one percent of all muscle. And it would make sense that glycogen is found in the muscle because whenever you're exercising, let's say you're you know deadlifting 2,000 pounds or something, <laughs> that would be cool. Um, well, your muscle needs to contract and relax, and that takes energy. And it uses the glycogen to uh, gather glucose, and it uses that glucose from the glycogen to create ATP. And so let's let's quickly talk about the difference of uh, metabolic pathways between the muscle and the liver.
Okay, so in the muscle, in the muscle specifically, uh, you're doing exercise. That's a good example. You need to uh, create ATP, and so you break down the um, the uh, glycogen, and that produces glucose, right? And then you break down the glucose to create ATP. Well, you broke down two molecules, right? So you broke down glycogen, and then you broke down glucose. And that process is actually called, uh, it's a big word, but it's glyco. So we have glyco, neo, neo, and then we have lysis. Okay, so glyco refers to glycogen. Neo is just a cute little word. And then lysis is cut. So we are cutting glycogen. Okay, that means that we are degrading or uh, cutting up glycogen. Okay, so this is glycogen degradation. Okay, and then uh, similarly, when we produce glucose, we're going to break down the glucose and the muscle to create uh, ATP. And so what do we call that? We call that glyco, glyco lysis. So we have glycolysis, right? <laughs> and that's what we're going to be studying in the next chapter. Woo, whoop de doo right? So we have glyconeolysis, and then we have glycolysis. And glycolysis is just a degradation of glucose to produce ATP. And so the process of glycolysis is just glucose degradation, right? Or degradation. So we have uh, glucose. Uh, degradation. Okay, so that's it. That's for the muscle. And now I'm going to clear the board and we're going to do it in a nice purple color. Uh, what happens in the liver? Well, the liver, the liver is actually kind of different, right? So it is using up the glycogen storages and is converting that into glucose and is going to be using that glucose to feed the blood, right? So we want to produce blood sugar or I guess sugar levels for the blood, right? So of course, we're still going to have glyconeolysis, uh, right? So we have uh, glyconeolysis, right? And we know that that is glycogen uh, degradation, but then we're going to convert it to glucose and we're going to not break the glucose down. Right, so we're gonna call that we're gonna call that gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. Genesis, and so we know that genesis means creation, and gluco is a secret code word for glucose. <laughs> so this is a glucose creation. Okay, so now if you see those terms on any exam or a Starbucks or something, you will know what they mean and when, where they occur and why they occur. Okay, so here we can see the similarities between a simple starch mo molecule or polysaccharide and a glycogen polysaccharide. They're both made of glucoses, right? But notice that in the animal cell, glycogen has more branching than a plant cell. Okay, so starch, uh, it branches out about 25 uh, sugars, right? So we have the amylose right here. This is the main chain. We have amylose and every 25 roughly uh, sugar molecules, you're gonna have a branching out of amylopectin. Okay, so this has branching, it has branching uh, every 25 uh, 25 um, sugars, let's just say. Yeah. Here, sugars means uh, glucose. But glycogen, well, it needs to have more, um, well, it needs to have more sugars in it, okay? And the more branching you have, the more sugars you can hold in a less amount of space, right? So that's what we do. Uh, glycogen actually branches out every 8 to 10 sugars, okay? So it branches branches every uh, eight to 10 sugars. 
and we can see here everything that you see here is glucose. So we have the main uh, glycogen chain, which is just glucose, and then every eight glucoses, we have another branching of glucose. Okay, so this one right here has a lot of non-reducing ends, right? So these little purple thingies that you see here are non-reducing ends. You are not going to connect anything to these uh, purple ends, okay? So you have uh, this non-reducing ends, and then you're only going to have like one reducing end. So it's just one long chain, right? And remember that reducing ends means that you can add another glucose molecule to that end. And a non-reducing end means that you cannot add a glucose molecule over there, okay? And you're probably wondering, well, Brian, um, why do we have so many non-reducing ends? Why, why do we need that? I mean, it just kind of looks weird. I mean, wouldn't it be more efficient to have less reducing ends? Well, not necessarily, because in order to convert the polysaccharide glycogen into the uh, monosaccharide glucose, we need an enzyme. And that enzyme is gonna be called glycogen, glycogen phosphor, uh, phosphorylase. So phosphorylase. And so we know that it's an enzyme because it has ACE in it. And what this ACE does, this enzyme, is that it goes to these little purple non-reducing glucoses, okay? And it's gonna pick them off at the same time. Hmm, that's weird. Well, it does a lot of reactions, but it's easier, it's, it's more simpler if you just imagine that it picks it up at uh, multiple times. An easier, an easier uh, way to imagine this is to imagine the glycogen as a bundle of grapes. And you're hungry. It's about 2 in the morning, you just had a nightmare, and you want some grapes. So you go to the fridge and you get the bundle of grapes. Now the grapes in this example are going to be uh, glucoses, uh, specifically the non-reducing glucoses. So this actually goes to the non-reducing, non-reducing uh, glucoses. So that should be uh, a U. In this example, it's, it's the purple ones, okay? So uh, back to our uh, grape example, your hand is going to be acting as the glycogen phosphorylase. Now you grab the glycogen polysaccharide, and with your right hand or your left hand, you grab a bundle of grapes, let's say 10 grapes. Well, the enzyme was able to react with the polysaccharide glycogen and pull off 10 uh, glucoses, right? And so the branching allows it to have more non-reducing ends for the enzyme to pick out. You know, if we only had, let's hypothetically, let's say that glycogen looked exactly the same as a starch polysaccharide. Well, if glycogen phosphorylase tried to uh, interact with this guy over here, well, at the most, he's gonna get 10. But if I do it over here, where there's more non-reducing glucoses, you're gonna get 50, maybe 100. You have more glucoses available to you know, react. And that makes it really efficient as a storage unit for glucoses, right? Because as an animal, uh, you don't want to have a limited supply of energy. You want to have a large supply of energy. If a cheetah who has uh, you know, a lot of energy well, a cheetah wouldn't want to have storage units like a starch molecule, right? It would go really slow, it would be tired all the time, that's bad. But when it has glycogen in it, well, there's a lot more glucoses to be um, reacted with. And now we can generate more glu um, glucoses with the glycogen polysaccharide. And so whenever a glycogen phosphorylase takes away the non-reducing uh, glycogen, let's say over here, well, it's going to move on, right? It's going to move on to the next one. So this one doesn't exist. It's a, gly it's a glucose molecule now. It's gonna go to this one. And then afterwards, it's gonna go down the chain until there's no more uh, glycogen left, right? And then we're gonna have to restore the glycogen for uh, later storage. But that's essentially why we have so much branching in the glycogen polysaccharide molecule. And that's also why we also have so many non-reducing ends for glycogen. We will now be talking about uh, glycoproteins. So essentially, imagine 
a chain, a huge chain, miles long, of sugar, specifically glucose. And we attach the reducing end of that sugar chain to a protein, right? And we call that sugar chain, or sugar chain the oligosaccharide. We will bind the oligosaccharide, which means many sugars, to the protein, right? And if we bind that uh, reducing end to the nitrogen, we call that an N-linked oligosaccharide. And usually, you're going to find these with arginine. Okay, so this is going to be arginine right here, right? So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, we can also do the same thing with oxygen. And that typically occurs with serine, serine, and also tyrosine. And um, I believe those are the main ones, right? So we have tyrosine as well. Well, why is that important? I mean, there's only, what, three options. Either you connect to a serine, a tyrosine, or an arginine, and they all rhyme, so it must not be important. Well, it is, because what if, instead of having glucoses, we had mannoses, or fructoses, or sucroses, or other things that rhymed? Well, you would have different properties. What if this protein right here does something different when it's attached to a lactose? What if it does something different when it's attached to a sucrose? What if it goes through a different metabolic pathway? And see, sometimes your life depends on these metabolic pathways. What if you need a lactose to connect to a protein in order to live? And if you didn't get that, well, you would die. And so glycoproteins actually are a huge uh, major player in your living, right? So without glycoproteins, you wouldn't exist. Uh, we'll actually dive deeper into that right now. One of the main reasons why we have glycoproteins is because they act as markers for the cell type. What does that mean? Well, it means that depending on what type of oligosaccharide is attached to the protein, you will have well, different reactions to different uh, molecules. Uh, for instance, let's say that you have a cell, right? And the cell has uh, a glycoprotein. Let's make this glycoprotein uh, a party hat. Okay, well the cell, since it has this glycoprotein, it's actually going to accept a hormone, right? So it's gonna accept a hormone. Let's make this mm, eh, a circle, right? Let's call this testosterone. Without this little glycoprotein, your cell would not have the ability to interact with this testosterone hormone. And for guys, that would actually reduce, uh, well, reduce the, how should I say, well, it's just going to reduce the overall um, livelihood of men, right? Uh, for people who have estrogen, uh, well, it's not going to accept estrogen as readily, right? And so, if you're going on hormone therapy, you want your glycogen, uh, well, you want your glycoproteins to be existing, right, in order to accept either testosterone or estrogen. And without glyco, um, well, I guess, excuse me, <laughs> without glycoproteins, you wouldn't have those treatments, right? So if you have low testosterone, glycoproteins allow you to accept incoming hormones, okay? Therefore, we can say that glycogen, or why do I say glycogen? Therefore, we can say that glycoproteins, <laughs> um, they actually influence cell molecule interactions. So let's just call this uh, G protein. G protein influence, influence uh, cell molecule interactions okay uh, let's say that our cell who is wearing a party hat that is a glycoprotein wants to go into uh, a different part of the body let's say a different cell right so we have this big cell right and he wants to go inside but let's say that he forgot his hat that he forgot his glycoprotein well, this cell is not going to accept him. It's going to say no, no, uh, needs, and it's going to need a glycoprotein, specifically this one, okay? So if our little cell had a hat that was, I don't know, a little rectangle, well, that's not gonna work. That's the wrong glycoprotein. Your cell is not going to be accepted into this uh, metabolic pathway or into this different cell. Instead, the bouncers are gonna you know, come out 
of the alley, and these are actually going to be called the white blood cells. Okay, so now we have the white blood cells, and they're going to gang up on our cell because we don't have a glycoprotein. This is a different interaction, but the interaction that I want to talk about first, or at least name, is the cell to cell interaction. So if you don't have a specific glycoprotein, your cell is not going to be able to interact with different other cells. So this is a cell uh, cell interaction. And so now these little white blood cells are going to gang up on our hero because he's not wearing his party hat. Okay? He's not wearing the specific glycoprotein. Now this interaction, whenever something gets uh, beaten up by our white blood cells in the body, is called an anti antigenic antigenic reaction. And that's essentially your body's way of saying, hey, you know, this is a foreign substance. You're like a virus or a bacteria or something. You're not wearing the specific glycoprotein that is safe in this body. And I'm going to send out these white blood cells and they're going to gang up on you and they're going to beat you up and shoot you out. Okay, So that is the antigenic reaction. Um, but in this scenario, our, our cell found its uh, party hat. It's fine. The uh, white blood cells were called off. Okay. Now, that kind of brings us to our blood types. Our blood molecules, our red uh, blood cells, they actually have little tiny uh, glycoproteins on the surface. Now, let's say that your blood type A, and hypothetically, let's say that blood type A has these little triangle hats on the red blood cells. Well, somebody who has uh, blood type AB, well, they can donate to you, right? Because blood type AB, uh, they have uh, a red blood cell with little triangles on it. Uh, aside from that, they also have little uh, glycoproteins that are circle-shaped, let's say, hypothetically. Well, they could still donate to you because they have that glycoprotein. However, uh, somebody who is just a uh, B-type for blood cannot donate to you because they only have circles on the red blood cells. And so if you were to try to uh, inject B-type blood into your body and you're a blood type A, your uh, anti- um, well, your white blood cells are going to attack that foreign substance. They're going to treat it like it's some sort of bacteria or a viral infection. And so glycoproteins actually keep you alive via uh, these three reactions. They do cell molecule interactions, which is when the cell has a glycoprotein that accepts uh, hormones in this example. Uh, they have cell-cell interactions in, in which the big cell accepts the little cell and allows it to do metabolic pathways as long as it has a glycoprotein for uh, marking, right? So I, I know what cell you are because of your glycoprotein. Uh, and then it also does the antigenic reaction in which it keeps your body safe by uh, eliminating foreign substances that don't have the glycoprotein on them. So you can tell that glycoproteins are very important to our body and to our livelihood. And with that, my dear viewer or friend or, you know, um, that is the end of this video. Uh, we covered carbohydrates. So hopefully you understand carbohydrates, why they're so important, why they're so delicious, and why we have a whole trillion dollar industry of trying to find out which makes the greatest uh, sugary product. Okay, so hopefully you, you uh, will do well on your uh, exam. I hope this video helped you out. And remember that I love you and that you will do amazing on your exams. So have a great day and be safe.